welcome to La Vida Las Vegas podcast. We're two physical therapists living the life in Las Vegas. I'm Dr. Erica. And I'm Dr. Joe. We created this podcast for two reasons. First, to connect the healthcare, wellness, and fitness communities in Las Vegas. And second, to highlight all the amazing people we've met along the way. Thank you for listening. And remember to take care of yourself. Appreciate you showing up today. Yeah. If you want to introduce yourself and sure. tell us what you do. Yeah. My, my name is Jeff Franks. Uh, my call sign is El Gato. And uh, I am a Air Force F-35A pilot and an instructor at the Air Force Weapons School in the Nevada Air National Guard. Uh, and I am a husband and a father of two amazing kids. Outstanding. That is, that is what I do. So what brought you to Vegas? Uh, military. So uh, we came here from Yuma, Arizona. I don't know if you've ever been to Yuma. Um, if you have, you probably passed through Yuma on the way to the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were there for four years, uh, military. Um, so what I was doing there was I was an instructor uh, at the Marine Weapons School. Uh, it's called Marine Aviation Weapons Tactics Squadron 1, or MOTS 1. We love our acronyms. Uh, back then I was flying the F-18 Hornet, uh, which I flew for about 11 and a half years. Um, and a weapon school, it basically is a place where we teach the teachers. So we make the instructors that will then go back to a, uh, operational squadron and then they are responsible for the tactical proficiency of everybody else in that squadron. So back when I was a Marine, uh, which I was for about 16 and 16 years and change, uh, that's what I was doing there. And then uh, from there, um, when the F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter, which is the newest um, strike fighter that the, all three services, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps uh, purchased, when that started to become um, a thing, it was basically going to reach what's called uh, uh, Initial Operational Capability, or IOC, and so when that happened, um, it's the basically the same jet with some minor uh, physical properties that are different in order to meet the service needs. So, for instance, the Navy variant, which is the F-35C, is a carrier variant, so it's a little bit bigger, has a beefier landing gear, so it can withstand the forces of landing on a on an aircraft carrier. Um, the Marine version is a short takeoff vertical landing version. That's the or Stovall, which is the F-35B. And then the Air Force is a conventional takeoff and land, or CTOL, which is the F-35A. So those are just minor characteristics, um, the, uh, physical characteristics that are different, but tactically it's basically the same. All the avionics, the sensors um, are virtually the same. And so the three services did not want to uh, stovepipe tactics, you know what I mean? So we didn't want to make Air Force tactics, Navy tactics, and Marine tactics wanted to have, because it's the joint strike fighter, so... Bottom line is the Marine Corps and the Air Force weapons schools decided to start an exchange, uh, what's called an inter-service exchange program, which is where an officer from one service will move and uh, live and work with officers from a different service, and then an officer from that service will go to where that officer came from. So between the Marine Corps and the Air Force, just do a swap, uh, which is what brought us here. Um, so not very many Marines here uh, in Nevada at Nellis Air Force Base just because it's an Air Force Base, obviously. But that's what brought us here. So what made you want to be a pilot and pursue that route? Ooh. Um, I have wanted to be a fighter pilot since I was like five, five or six. Um, my uncle was a, was a pilot uh, in the Air Force. He flew the uh, C-141 Starlifter, uh, which is no longer in service. Uh, and I just idolized him. Uh, he's the only person in my family that's been in the military. Um, and I just, I don't know, I was, I just love everything about aviation and wanted to be a fighter pilot. And uh, so when I was in college, um, I think I kind of grew out of that. You know, kids want to be astronauts or something. And you sort of like, okay, let's get real. We got to get an actual job. Um, and, but then a very good friend of mine that I grew up with, he, uh, he joined the Marine Corps to become a pilot. And, so I didn't even know the Marine Corps had jets. And uh, he's like, yeah, what are you talking about? They have jets. And, and so um, that's how I got into it. So um, I, I don't know. I just love tactical aviation, ripping around the skies and pulling 9Gs and blowing stuff up. And it's 
It's just what I've always wanted to do. Did the movie Top Gun have any influence? Oh, boy. Here we go. I knew that was coming. Uh, yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, I don't know if any kids that were... Like the volleyball scene specifically? Or? Specifically the volleyball yeah. scene, definitely. Um, so I can tell you that uh, I have been to Top Gun. I'm a graduate from Top Gun. We did not play volleyball. <laughs> I did not shack up with any of the uh, female contract uh, instructors there. Um any motorcycle riding on base? No, no motorcycle oh, riding. Okay. Uh, you have a cool jacket. Yeah. <laughs> I do have. A, I do have a sweet uh, jacket with the fur and everything. Yeah. Um, now, I, probably every kid that was a kid in the mid '80s. What did that come out? '85, '86, something like that. Top Gun. Yeah, definitely. That was probably what at least you know increased the motivation to become a fighter pilot, if not the inception. So. So what's yeah. the, the process of that? And you went from college and mm-hmm. kind of tell us a little bit more about how you got into that and what does it take, you know, to, to be a fighter pilot, right? That's like probably someone, you tell someone that and they're probably, damn, that's fucking cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, it's a little bit different for each service. So, um, you know, some guys will go to a service academy, like the Air Force Academy or the Naval Academy, something like that. There's also the um, Military Academy at West Point, uh, which is, um, you know, where generally people will come out of that. They'll become Army officers. So um, one thing that's unique about the Marine Corps is that um, the Marine Corps is actually not a, a department. So we have, uh, you know, a department of the Army, department of the Air Force, a department of the Navy. And those are actually your branches of military service. Within the Department of the Navy, you have the Navy and the Marine Corps, both under those departments. So really what that comes down to is, is uh, requirements and congressional funding for the military. So they fund the departments, and then basically the Department of the Navy in this context will decide uh, where money's going to go for the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps. Where I'm going with this is that because of that, there are different, um, you know, uh, basically Department of Defense military needs that are provided uh, in terms of a capability from each one of those branches. So if you go to a military academy, generally you will uh, be commissioned as an officer and serve in uh, in that service. So you go to the Air Force Academy, most Uh, officers that are commissioned as second lieutenants will serve in the Air Force, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually go to any service academy and then you can be commissioned uh, to a different service. So that is one route. Um, Another route would be ROTC, if you're familiar with that, uh, Reserve Officer Training Course, I think is what it stands for. Um, And then there's like Air Force ROTC, Army ROTC, Naval ROTC, again, because of the departments, right? So if you go to Naval ROTC, you could be commissioned as a Naval officer, as an ensign, or you could be commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Um, Or you can just get a degree and you can go to officer candidate school, which is what I did. So I actually went to college on a football scholarship. Um, And then my buddy that I was mentioning that I grew up with, um, his late mother and my late father uh, worked together at at a hospital in Oregon. And um, so I've known him since I was like 14. And um, and he said, dude, why don't you join the Marine Corps? And uh, so what it takes, I would say, is uh, one is a willingness to serve. Um, You know, if you join the military with any notions to make money, you're probably crazy. Um, if you, uh, if you join because you want to do a certain job that can be a little bit dangerous, you know, because, um, a lot of people have a notion that they want to, they want to be a snake eater and they want to get into special forces or something like that. And then for whatever happens, they don't make it. And then now you're, it's not like you can leave, (laughs) you know, you're in. So you might be sitting at a desk for four years. Um, so for, from my, from my experience, I would say what it takes is, is having a very fast, what we call OODA loop. Have you ever heard of an OODA loop? Uh, so the, it's an acronym O-O-D-A, and it's a loop. So it's observe, orient, decide, and act. So it's the ability to observe what's going on around you, orient yourself situationally, whether it's ge- geom- geometrically, you know, where am I in space and time in my aircraft, for instance, or where am I in terms of the flow of a certain mission, uh, what are we tactically doing, things like that. So, and then make a decision about what I need to do and then act on that decision. And then based on the action, that will 
then cause another observation. So I did something, I made a choice of some kind, and the outcome of that choice is X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Okay, now I need to orient my observe and then orient myself in this new framework of uh, decision-making possibilities and then act. And then that whole thing just continues to be a loop. And so I think that really um, having a fast OODA loop is probably um, the, the thing that sets a fighter pilot apart maybe from, you know, other types of pilot uh, or aviation, you know. Not to say that if you're not a fighter pilot, you don't have a fast OODA loop, uh, but I think that that's probably a, a requirement because things happen very, very fast when you're moving at, you know, 10 miles a minute um, and there's a lot going around you and a lot of, uh, a lot of sensory stimulation, um, especially in the jet that I fly now. And we can get into some big difference between, like, say, the F-18 Hornet and the F-35, but I think that that's probably the, the number one thing. It's really not a physical capability. It's a mental capability to make very fast decisions. Do you feel like people start at similar baselines for that? or there? Are, I mean, obviously some people are a little bit more like aware of what's going on around them than other people, but is that also something you could train with a little bit of practice oh, and yeah. as other things become automatic, you can focus your attention a little bit further than what you're just supposed to be doing task-wise? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, definitely there is there are some guys that just have an innate capability to, um, you know, have a fast, they just have a, a, a faster baseline of an OODA loop, for instance. There's some guys that just have a, an innate hand-eye coordination um, capability. Um, but just like there's no born leaders, you know, you can, um, you know, you can train people to improve on those things. And really that's, that's kind of, I think, when you get to a level where it's about teaching other people how to teach others to then teach others, and that train sort of continues... Um, that is, I think the skill that sets guys apart is, um, it's not necessarily the physical performance. Uh, it's not even the mental performance. It's the, uh, human factors performance and understanding how human beings can perform and what is required. How to identify weaknesses and strengths in people and maximize strengths and minimize weaknesses. So it is definitely trainable for sure. As far as different uh, teaching styles, if you're teaching people, they're going to be teachers that would obviously be a different approach. Like Kind of like what, what we do, if we're working with coaches, it might be a little bit different conversation because you'll tell them a little bit more of like what to look out for mm -hmm. and then maybe even tell them more like common mistakes you see people do and then this is how you correct it or this is like, you know, commonly when people are doing this, you'll see these three mistakes. Yep. Like, is it kind of a similar thing if you were teaching that group of people? It is um, with the added um, challenge of ego. Um, so I think that, um, a lot of the, I would say the number one challenge to overcome is, is really ego. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so if I, if I am providing feedback to a future instructor, um, if, if that feedback is not necessarily well received, uh, for whatever reason, then I kind of have two choices. I can acknowledge my own ego and I can, I can be firmly grounded in my understanding that I'm correct and this other person is wrong. And then I can basically cement myself to that and then I can kind of brush that person off and say, well, you can either listen to my instruction and get better or you can disregard my instruction and you're going to continue to struggle. Or... I can say, well, if my goal is to improve this person's human capacity for performance, then I'm going to have to modify my instructional capability, which means that I'm going to have to let go of my ego to do that. And in my opinion, I think that that is a trait that is common across all of the guys that I work with, um, some more than others. But the best instructors, I think, are the ones that can basically leave ego at the door and they walk into an instructional domain and they understand that we are here to get better. Therefore, if my goal is to make you better, then I'm going to have to modify myself in order to get, you know, impart my, excuse me, my instructional, um, you know, teaching to you. 
And so I think that is probably the number one thing is letting go of ego. What's the average age of somebody that would be going through that course then? Um, so at the Air Force Weapons School, um, I would say it's tough to come across an average. Uh, the F-35 is very new. So we are still seeing the majority of our uh, future instructors that are called, we call them WUGs for short, which is a weapons officer upgrade. So um, they're, they're usually coming from a previous platform because the F-35 is so new. Uh, the F-35A, which is the Air Force variant, uh, IOC'd in 2017. We're, so we're just now starting to get our very first, what we call, uh, so we, we call the F-35 the Panther, and uh, we're getting our first Panther babies, quote unquote. Um, most of the guys up to this point are a little bit older, so they're probably in their late 20s to mid 30s. Um, and now we're starting to see some guys that are in their mid to maybe even early 20s. But it's a pretty wide spectrum because, you know, we may, so right now we have six students in this class um, and we have uh, one Panther baby and then the rest are all previous, uh, you know, previously flew a different aircraft. So it's tough to kind of get an average for that because we're kind of in this transit transitionary period right now. I was just curious if age had anything to do with the ego factor that you're talking about or if some people are a little bit older, mm. maybe they're a bit more humble or they take to learning a little bit differently. Great question. Um, I don't know if it's age specific, but a lot of the kids that are in a certain age group these days have some of those millennial tendencies for sure. Um, so I would say that a common trait that we see um, is um, some of these kids kind of have this feeling that if an idea comes through their brain that it's automatically solid gold. And um, that is definitely something that we have to identify and work on, which goes back to ego. So I think, um, you know, they're all very, very good when they come to us. They're, they're the, they, can't come, they can't come to us unless they are the top pilot in their squadron. So um, there's ego in a different way, I think. Um, they generally all know, though, because once the reality of their skills are tested, then they it, it comes crumbling down, and they immediately know, okay, I'm going to have to let go of my ego so that I can learn. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to fail. So a lot of the training would be more object, objective then, so it's they can't really like out-argue it. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, there's no hiding. Yeah, your skills will be tested, and there's no, there's no... There's no opportunity to interpret in a different way the outcome either of success or failure. It's very obvious. We either lost five of our pilots on this training mission, meaning in combat they would be dead, or and or we did not achieve the mission success, and it's black and white. So there's no, well, I disagree with the outcome. Like, no, no, no. He's dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. And we did not strike that target. The B-2 is gone. Uh, whatever it is. So yeah, very, very easy to assess outcome. And so realities are very stark. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of reporting after you become a mission or like have done a mission and Mm -hmm. you get that feedback. Is it typically that you'll get that feedback? Because you mentioned like it depends on, you know, when you're getting that. Is it during that debriefing or is Mm -hmm. it in actual time when people are, when you're actually going through the drills and stuff? Very good question. So it's both. So there will be some immediate feedback um, so for instance, um, if, if you two are pilots flying another aircraft that is representing the adversary and I shoot a simulated missile at both of you and the way it works is we will have, uh, somebody who's called the range training officer, an RTO, I will call a shot and then I will call a kill and then he will come back and he will say copy kill or he will say PK miss. PK miss is a probability of kill, meaning because nothing is perfect. Missiles are not perfect. They don't work 100% of the time. And so he'll, let's say you are the northern in a group and you're the southern, and he says, copy, kill northern, PK miss southern. There's that immediate feedback. You're still alive, you're dead. So now I have to deal with you still. So there's that kind of a feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if I'm bombing a target and I say kill whatever that target is, the RTO says PK miss or copy, kill. It's still there or it's gone. Now, 
Um, because it's all simulated, we have to uh, we have to go through some processes in order to actually get what we call the truth data, which is a part of our uh, very lengthy debrief process. And then that's where the ultimate truth will will come out. So there is some immediate feedback mm -hmm. from which you then use those outcomes to make decisions on what to do next during a mission. And then when you learn what decisions you made that were either good or bad, the 80 to 90 percent of that is going to come in the debrief and our debriefs are, are pretty long so usually somewhere between six to eight hours is uh, how long we debrief a sortie and that was for a fly time of 45 minutes to an hour that's crazy it's all on the same day mm -hmm. okay yeah it as far as uh when you go about coaching or teaching people i don't know how what word you use to refer to that like do you say coaching teaching instructing instructing Te yeah teaching instructing okay. yeah uh, do you have any uh, techniques that you found have been pretty helpful or things that you've learned on the job where you've learned, hey, it's a little bit better if I'm not just approaching it from the ego standpoint that you're talking about, but maybe which words you use, um, like relating to people that you can tell are more like the millennial generation as opposed to somebody that you know has been around for a little while longer? Mm -hmm. So, man, that's a really good question. I think um, it it really does go back to me dropping my ego and understanding that I have to be very uh, adaptive in my instructional style. Uh, everybody's different. Everybody responds to positive and negative feedback differently. And so there's really no, um, you know, words or phrases. It's more a delivery mechanism that I have to constantly adapt. So if I have a student that doesn't react as well to his own failures and he has a propensity, for instance, to become defensive, then I know that um, if, you know, generally the moment somebody becomes defensive, then learning stops. And so if my goal is to increase the student's learning and make him better, then it's not really a phrase or, or a word. It's a delivery mechanism in which I'm going to have to really constantly make an assessment. Okay, when I'm, when I'm instructing this person, how are they reacting to that instruction? You know, most of human communication is nonverbal, right? So when I, if I see a body language or I see a facial expression or something that I can kind of see that, you know, okay, this is working, all right, I'm going to continue this way, or this is not working. Um, I can tell he's getting frustrated, or he might be getting pissed off at me because I'm identifying his weaknesses or whatever. Okay, now I'm going to have to kind of adapt. Um, if I am having a, tr if I'm having trouble doing that, then generally what I will do is I will stop talking and I will start asking questions. Um, and that will then allow the student to sort of talk themselves into their own instruction. Because when I ask specific questions the that are where they're not uh, leading questions, but there's like a, a only one correct answer to this question, um, then now they are providing their own instruction to themselves by answering my questions and then the learning sort of happens that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. Yeah. So you're considered probably the leader or the thought leader in the overall organizational type stuff. Is there is there something that you like like to research on your own to like improve your skills as an instructor or like the the field that you're in? Does that make sense? So there's certain people that we look up to, mm -hmm. and we look to for as mentorship and stuff. Who is that for you? Great question. Um, so I'm definitely not the leader. Uh, I'm one of uh, about nine other uh instructors in the squadron um uh so i'm i'm just one of those guys um y you know i wish i did more reading um really i learned from from other people so uh so often so when we fly there may be more than one instructor in a so generally we'll be kind of divided into four ships uh so there'll be four total pilots uh usually if it's uh you know two Usually probably be two students and two instructors, might be one instructor and three students. But any, in any case, there's an instructor of record or the IOR. So he's kind of the lead instructor for that given sortie. Um, so if I am not the instructor of record, then I will learn a lot by um, assisting that IOR but allowing him to kind of take the reins and be the primary guy. And so I, I do most of my learning of, man, like I really like that instructional style or I really, you, you really clearly got through to that student. 
Mm-hmm. And what we'll do generally after we do, so a brief to a flight to, you know, a six to eight hour debrief is we'll have like what we call it a round four, which is where we basically go to the bar and, and we'll grab some whiskeys or beer or whatever and we'll sit around and we'll just talk. And the IOR will say like, dude, so give me some feedback on, on, on how I did. What, what, what did you like that I did? And, or whatever, right? And and so that's where now the the instructors we will talk amongst ourselves about what worked, what didn't work, what could have been better. Like, man, I, I really failed, or I was having a really tough time um, with this student, you know, whatever it is. And that's really where I do most of my learning. I don't have a you know a book that I've read about a certain guy, um, you know. So I. I that's probably a failure of mine. I need to do more learning. Um, you ever, you guys ever heard of General Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis? He's a former Secretary of Defense uh, a little while ago. Anyways, he mm-hmm. he used to. So he was a, a Marine Four Star General, uh, and and then he retired and he was Secretary of Defense uh, a little bit ago. But he uh, he was really big on cultivating a five thousand year old mind, meaning that the more books you read about other people then you don't have to have lived 5,000 years, but you can have a 5,000-year mind just by learning from what they've written about successes and failures and things like that. I probably need to do more of that, but uh, I just don't. So I learn from other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good, though. I, mean, I think on-the-job learning is super helpful, too, and not just like what to do, but also what not to do because mm-hmm. you'll see people do something. Yes. You're like, well, that was not effective. I will not be doing that method. Or I will not say that yep. to that person. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I would say from superior leaders, um, you know, like so when I was, so I'm a lieutenant colonel now, but like back when I was a, a lieutenant or a captain and I watched the majors and the lieutenant colonels above me, sometimes, you know, you can learn more impactful lessons about what you don't want to do or how you don't want to be than you do from those that you want to emulate. So... Absolutely. Learning from other people on the job training is very effective. Well, people pay a lot of money for like mentorship and business coaching. It's the same thing. You know, you right. have people that are telling you what not to do really yep. is a lot of it. That's true. Very so much so. Translates into multiple facets of life, I would say. Yeah. Whether it's cooking or interacting with people, anything really. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't really matter what the job is, right? I mean, like everything that we've been talking about for the past 10, 15 minutes or whatever is, is just human interaction, communication, uh, human performance. It doesn't matter if you're flying $150 million jets or if you're in a CrossFit gym or if you're, you know, trying to start a small business or something like that. People are people are people. And so mm-hmm. it's really all the same. It's just a different con- context. Oh, yeah, so. absolutely. Do you find that as technology has gotten better, so since you've been around for a while seeing the different iterations of jets coming out, mm-hmm. have you noticed that the technology could almost buffer skill level to an extent? No. That's a great question, and it doesn't. Um, it is. It requires skill sets to be manifested in a different way, but the foundation of those skills has not changed. So, um, not to geek out on you too much, but uh, for instance, the in the F eighteen Hornet, um, you know what made a good pilot in the ability to have a fast U loop and not just fly your jet, but also like you know accomplish missions. But what made a good pilot was the ability to use or manipulate sensors on the aircraft to gain situational awareness. So I have to manipulate the radar or I have to manipulate the targeting uh, forward-looking infrared radar, the targeting pod, we call it. Um, You know, I have to manipulate this, manipulate that. In the F-35, which is massively advanced compared to my old aircraft, I don't have to manipulate anything. It just does it all of that situational awareness just shows up. But now I have to seep through all of that and I have to process the uh, enormous amount of situational awareness that it just delivers to me without me having to manipulate it. And and if I don't process that and, and focus on the one, two, three, or four critical, uh, you know, pieces of information amongst the hundreds of pieces of information, then I'm not going to be effective. So it's massively technologically advanced. And yes, if you do that well, you'll be much more lethal and survivable in the aircraft I fly now versus the one I used to fly. But the um, it still requires a lot of skill 
despite the technological leap, it's just a different skill set. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. That's Yeah, that's really interesting because I feel like there's just a lot of information now. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of information to filter through and like how do you know what information is the most important, like you right. mentioned, right? So when you transitioned in from those, are there like a lot of, what would you say is like besides the skill set that you've mentioned, like there's more information that you have to filter through? Is there anything else that you notice? Like, oh, like I'm used to having it on my right hand or mm-hmm. this wasn't on my left side. It's like, did that have to change in like your where coordination? where the cup holder is or, you know. <laughs> yeah, where the seat recline is. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah so I mean, uh, cockpit layout. So what you're, what you're referring to is human machine interface or HMI. Big, it's big, it's a big deal. Um, exa- you know, so the F-18 Hornet, had two throttles, so two engines. It had two throttles that when they were basically side by side, so when you put your hand on the both throttles and you move them, generally they both will move in the same at the same time, right? Um, the stick was in the middle, and it moved a lot, right? Now in the F-35, excuse me, it's a side stick over here, and it barely moves. It, it basically goes off of pressure. So the more pressure I add, the more it's going to deflect the control surface, whereas in the Hornet, if I want a bigger control surface deflection, I have to move the stick a lot. Um, in the F-35 the, and the Hornet, the throttle is on the left, um, only one engine, but now it moves completely differently, and it's actually not even called a throttle in the F-35. It's called an engine thrust request, or an ETR. It sounds intense. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, you know, in the in the Hornet, we had, uh, so we had a heads-up display, and then you had uh, a like standard like cathode ray tube like display on the left one on the right and then you had a color display in the middle and the f-35 basically if you took this computer and added another one and it made this a little bit longer and it was a flat screen touch display it's just one huge display right here that's all we have and it's a, a massive difference um i would say so i'm really into cars i love cars and um so if you were to think of like maybe a, a badass like 19, late, late 70s, early 80s muscle car, like a Shelby Mustang or, a, or a, an awesome like air-cooled 911 Turbo or something like that, compare that, that would be like an F-18 Hornet. Now look at a Tesla. So they both look like cars. Um, you know, a 911 Turbo from like the late, eight, late 70s, early 80s, awesome beautiful, fast, maneuverable, but what does it have? It has mechanical linkages, right? It has sprockets and bushings. Um, if you press the accelerator, there's cables and pulleys that are going to open up fuel injection, all this kind of stuff, right? Look at a Tesla. So there's still the same thing. I'm still pushing on a pedal, but there's no, there's nothing mechanical going on there. You're just telling the computer how fast you want to accelerate. That's very much like the F-35, there's only two switches in the cockpit where I'm not interfacing with a computer in the F-35, and that is the canopy open and close and the ejection handle. Hmm. Everything else, all I'm doing is telling the computer what I want the jet to do, and then the computer makes up its mind on how it's going to accomplish that task. I have no idea what's going on underneath the hood. No idea. Is that a little bit more scary, though? Because it feels like you're not, I mean, you're in control, but the computer's also deciding like what to do for you, in a sense. No, not really. No. no, because it's it's pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, so not really. It. Um, I if I had to go to war, I would definitely want to go to war in the F thirty five. If I just wanted to like go to an air show and like, I don't know, F eighteen Hornet is a beautiful aircraft. I loved flying that thing. You, do you guys know what the Hornet is? Have you ever seen the Blue Angels? Mm-hmm. That's what the Hornet is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that aircraft. Very cool. Minus the blue and yellow paint. Right. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Do, do they take a lot of feedback from pilots, I would assume, when they're developing that jet? Like as far as, like like you said, like the human interface with the technology, like do they listen to a lot of that and try and make to better designs? Not nearly enough, um, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, um, we do not have enough time in this podcast to talk about the <laughs> broken requirements engine and bureaucracy and defense contracting, but... Excuse me, I would say overall they nailed it, but it did not, it could have been better if they had listened to operators more. Um, so not as much as they should, unfortunately. It's still an amazing jet, though. All right, so I want to go back to the 
Oodle Loop. Okay. I, sound, I said that correctly, right? You did. Not Oompa Loompa. <laughs> okay. Uh, so t- let's talk about it from the beginning. Like when you started 18 years ago, how has your process been of that loop and how has it changed for you? Obviously, you've probably learned a lot from that, but can you tell us about what that looked like 18 years ago till now? Yeah. So um, I think a good analogy to think of being a fighter pilot is, is a hockey player. Um, so, you know, a hockey player doesn't think about skating. He just skates. He thinks about playing hockey, right? But in the beginning, you got to learn how to skate. So, you know, in the very beginning of military training and flight school is basically, uh, learning how to fly aircraft, which would be like learning how to skate. And then you can start to kind of have a hybrid of where you still have to kind of really focus on skating so you don't that doesn't mess up your ability to learn how to play hockey and then you eventually are only learning how to play hockey without thinking about skating and you can see where I'm going with this so Mm -hmm. so I think my ability to um, observe orient decide and act has become faster based off of my familiarity with all of the things that are like skating in the analogy of a hockey player. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think about flying at all. You asked earlier about technology advancements. That is probably one thing that has been very, um, has had a significant impact on um, performance. So, you know, we talked about how you don't have to have like a slower OODA loop in order to be very successful with more technology. But the fact that I don't have to think about skating in that analogy of a hockey player, like at all, because mm-hmm. the aircraft, it, it doesn't fly itself, but it, it is so amazingly easy to fly that jet um, that I can, only, I can get away with only focusing on the tactical scenario. And I don't think about flying whatsoever. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you spend a lot of hours, you know, planning and you, you, you're debriefing your, it's, it's a long day for you. And it's, I know you have to have some physical capabilities, but how do, how do you keep it, keep your mental game strong the whole day? You know, that's a long, long day. How do you keep yourself sharp? Um, well, so I do a lot of sitting, unfortunately. Um, so yes, I do have to do that. I leave really a lead a very stagnant lifestyle. Um, because I'm sitting at a desk, you know, whether I'm doing some things that are just unnecessary or sorry, necessary evils outside of flying an aircraft, uh, or I'm, you know, sitting in a briefing room or I'm sitting in the jet or I'm sitting in the debrief and things like that. Um, so CrossFit is a huge way for me to stay sharp. Um, you know, if all I can do is get that one hour in, uh, hopefully like, you know, four four times, five times, maybe a week, that is a huge part of it. My family is a a huge escape from the drain of, of the job, love the job, but it does take a mental, uh, toll for sure. So I stay sharp by trying to get eight hours of sleep, trying to not eat sugar, (laughs) um, basically just, you know, diet and try to stay fit. Yeah. So what got you into CrossFit? Um, so it's funny when I um, when I first heard about CrossFit, it was some other guys that were I was uh, that were fellow pilots and they were big into it. And I saw these stupid outfits and I was like, "There's no way I'm ever doing that. That is the most ridiculous thing ever. It's not what it's not what military guys are supposed to be doing. You just go and do bench press and squats and that's it." And uh, and then um, as I started going through you know, more advanced time consuming training, like going through Top Gun, going through the the Marine Weapons School, become an instructor at the Marine Weapons School. And I just saw that my day was just filling up and I I hated the way I felt. I did not I just I felt lethargic. I didn't look good. I did not I was just bad. Um and a buddy of mine's like, dude, just come out and do a workout. And I did one workout and I was like, this is it. I'm not doing this is perfect so uh that was what got me into crossfit what was your first workout you remember oh. no i don't remember i know i had a barbell and i know that there was some sort of a gymnastics movement like it was i think it might have been handstand push-ups and 
I was awful. I basically couldn't do it. And I'm not really one to just say like, okay, I won't ever do it then. Uh, and so I just said, well, this is bullshit. I'm going to figure this shit out right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then realized that I had no mobility. I couldn't get into a full squat and uh, everything that I had thought about fitness was wrong. And yeah, so I was hooked. That's good. Yeah. A lot of people have had some similar experiences. Like yeah. They thought they were super strong or thought they were fit and they did one workout and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. I feel like I maybe cried a little bit at the end of that. <laughs> that was a little life changing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I still feel like, I mean, I think everybody is scaling compared to somebody else, right? You know, you might be thinking that you're nailing it, doing whatever movement at 225. And then you realize that somebody else can do that same movement as fast at 275 or something, you know? So uh, humbling for sure. What's that? Humbling for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what else did you do to spend your time in Vegas? Um, really most of my time outside of work is, uh, is family stuff. Um, so my wife is a speech language pathologist and, uh, she's also very busy. Um, and so when we both have time away from our respective jobs, it's our kids. So we have our uh, twin girls. They are Claire and Isabel. Uh, they're both 12 years old, seventh graders at Faith Lutheran Medical, uh, middle school, excuse me. And it's their activities. Um, so we're really just trying to get them into golf. Uh, they do volleyball and basketball. And so, um, you know, because we, we spend a lot of time doing our, our sources of income, our employment, you know. Um, and so we try to, when we have the time, to focus on, on family stuff and do things as a family. So there's so much to do here, as you know. Um, try to get outside. Obviously, the COVID stuff has kind of limited our ability to do, is, you know, some of the things we'd like to be doing. But um, so we try to golf, um, like to play basketball and um, we love to cook. We love to drink. So, yeah, that's basically what we do. What do you cook? Uh, I'm the, I'm the, the meat guy. So, uh, I'm not, so when I say that I, sh- I should be careful because there's some people that are big into like smoking and brisket. I don't do any of that stuff. I like to just sort of be brilliant in the basics. So, um, I just like to take a good steak and make it, make it good because it's a good cut of meat and it's cooked well, but I don't have a Traeger or do any of the, the smoking or any of that kind of stuff. So, Gotcha. So what's your favorite cheat meal? Favorite cheat meal? Oh, mm-hmm. that is a great question. So a cheat <coughs> meal is usually a dessert, right? Can so, be. Okay. So I mean, it doesn't matter. It's something you enjoy eating. Like well, bacon with sugar on it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the really the only thing that we are we try to, you know, be strict about, I think, is is limiting sugar. So if it comes from an animal or grows out of the ground, we eat the shit out of it. So, <laughs> so for a cheat meal, I guess it would be something packed with sugar. And uh, my daughters are very good bakers. Mm. And so uh, it's probably just going to be very simple. It's cookies and ice cream. I love cookies and ice cream. It's <laughs> a good one. What kind of ice cream? Um, so so uh, I like to take vanilla ice cream and I like to put buttermilk in it. And then buttermilk, yeah, huh? and mix it in with the ice cream, huh? And then take cookies and have that on the side, kind of like a milkshake, uh, but it's still in a bowl. It wasn't put into a blender, huh? Yeah, okay, huh? I've never heard of that yeah. before. Yeah, if it that... were up to me, it would be it would be goat milk, actually. Really? Yeah, I grew up. Uh, so my dad was a doctor, but we had a farm. Uh, it was basically just, it was not a, an income source farm. It was basically just our food. We had cows, we had goats, we had chickens, we had geese. Um, and so all of our dairy products, for the most part, were goat dairy. We had uh, a lot of kefir. We had uh, goat milk, obviously. We had um, ice cream made from goat milk and stuff like that. Huh, I've yeah. never heard of that as yeah. being a thing. Yeah. So what's the difference between a goat ice cream and then like a cow ice cream? It has a very, um, a very, have you ever had goat cheese? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just imagine that kind of a little bit gamey, a little bit more acidic type of a taste, I guess. More, um, more crumbly like the cheese? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, it, yeah, just take that kind of unique goat flavor and uh-huh. move that over to whatever the thickness or 
you know, amount of solid or liquid there is there. Yeah. Huh. Could you tell if like the goat ate something different that the goat ice cream mm. was a little bit different? Like a little bit of, a little bit of garlic in this one. I can't say I, rem- I remember that. It always Some onions maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was like raising twins. I know they're 12 now, but mm-hmm. from zero to 12, what was yeah. that like with two of them? Well, um, so, you know, it's tough to make a comparison to what it would be like to compare, you know, cause that's all we know. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we did with a little bit of lack of credibility, make a comparison based off of, you know, acquaintances or friends that don't have twins, it seems like you kind of, you put in your work early, uh, and, and then you, you maybe have a little bit of a payoff later on, um, <laughs> especially in military, you know, cause we move all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll just be very, very upfront about this. Uh, Andrea, my wife, is the greatest person I've ever known. She is a saint because she did most of the early years without me because I was gone. I was either at Top Gun, or I was at WTI, or I was deployed in Afghanistan or Iraq or Japan or something. Um, so, you know, she had to do a lot of the very difficult times uh, by herself or, you know, with her with her mom or something like that. So, but I think overall to answer your question, it seems like you have a, you have a significant more difficult, much more of a difficult time when they're, when they're infants to the toddler years. But then as they get a little bit older, you know, they always have a best friend. They always have somebody who's sharing whatever the new experience is. They're sharing it with somebody else. So they're never, never alone, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Move to a new school, they're not going to that new school completely by themselves, even if they're not in the same class, or at least going there and walking in together, and then they're leaving together with their, with their twin. So I think as they get a little bit older, you know, the, the, the benefit starts to kind of exponentially go up just because they have shared experiences. Um, so, yeah. You guys play basketball together. You guys play like two on one, one on horse or twenty one because you can play. Yeah, 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 a lot of pig, a lot of horse. Um, play some. I think Isabel is a little bit more into basketball than Claire is. Claire is a little bit more into volleyball than Isabel is. So I would say I probably do more one on one with Isabel, who's uh, two minutes younger than her twin sister Claire. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do we do play outside quite a bit. And thankfully now, I don't know if you noticed, they put all of the rims back up on Mm -hmm. park basketball courts. Mm. Finally. Uh, Or hoops, excuse me. So, yeah. yeah, I just saw that like literally two or three days ago. Maybe Mm -hmm. they've been up for longer than that, but I didn't notice it. So hopefully we'll get back to playing a little more basketball. So what's something that you've learned that you wish you knew sooner? Oh, man. What a great question. Um, I wish that I knew the importance of communication um, and like setting my pride and my ego aside way earlier. I think that I have friendships that could be even better now than they, um, or there's friendships that I don't have now because of my immaturity in controlling ego and pride when I was younger. Um, in my marriage too, you know, I think probably the, any of the friction we have is generally due to communication. And sometimes I do not, uh, set aside my ego and my bride, um, nearly as much as I should. So it's definitely something that I wish that I had known the importance of a lot younger so that I could have maybe avoided some learning through struggle (laughs) that I have. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's something you've been working on, whether it's professionally, personally, ment- mentally, or physically? What's something that you're excited about? Oh, man. I'm asking some really tough questions. Something I'm excited about. Um, well, right now, what we are, I, I guess our family is excited about is um, what's next, you know? So I will be retiring from the military after 20 years in less than two years, um, while my wife will be two years more solidified in her prof- profession uh, as our children will have finished their freshman year of high school. So how do we, really it's 
how do we maximize uh, our the things that we're doing now with our children so that we can start to enjoy empty nesting later on, you know, <laughs> setting them up for success. So that's really what is our focus is making sure that we raise our, our two girls to be God-loving, good people. You know, we've always thought that it's more important to ask them what type of a person you want to be more than what do you want to be when you grow up, you know, because I could care less really what they do for a profession, but I am very concerned and interested in what type of a person they want to be. And so that's what we're trying to do is focus on that so that, um, you know, we can enjoy watching them grow up. Yeah. I like that. I like the way that you put that, like what kind of person that you want to be. It puts things in a little bit more perspective. It's not as narrow focused as just your occupation. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I actually think I realized that over this past year is that I'm not just my identity of a my occupation, right? Like, is it, that was like my, my only thing that I was holding on to, but mm -hmm. it's always more than that, right? Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, like you could also be a cook and a dancer, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Are you kind? Are you compassionate? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think we focus on that as much. You know, I mean, you sort of just innately know it. Like, I'm gonna hang out with this person because they're not a jerk. <laughs> Be nice to me, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's not necessarily how we identify ourselves, I guess. So no, that's good. I like that a lot. Yeah. So what's something you commonly see in your practice that you wish more people knew? Um, so you, is your question common that I see that I wish people that are in my profession knew or, uh, that people are, that are not in my profession knew? Either way, you take it's it either good, way. Yeah. Let's oh, do both. Okay. Um, I wish that people in my profession understood the importance of humility and leaving egos at the door and, um, and really just understanding what are the four main components of human performance, which is expectation level, resources, motivation, and ability. So I think sometimes uh, people in my profession, they don't understand that you know when you set high expectations generally people are going to rise to those expectations and so they're concerned about people's ability to accomplish things and so they just lower expectations and then human performance goes down so humility and lack of ego and then those four things for human performance would be what i wish more people in my profession understood um outside of my profession uh like a so people that are onlookers of my profession, um, I don't think anybody really knows uh, how much, you know, they think of a fighter pilot, they just think of some dude pulling nine Gs and raging around the sky, um, but it's, it's all human interaction and communication, understanding the human condition, human factors, and in human performance, I think is is not specific to whatever the occupation is because people are still people. And so what makes a person a good instructor of flying F-35 or making a leader um, for an eventual unfortunate combat situation is probably a lot of the same skills that make a um, person a successful business owner or things like that. Yeah. Can you describe to us what that feels like to hit 9Gs? <laughs> Uh, it can be painful. Yeah. So, uh, it is a workout flying the aircraft, uh, especially if we're doing what we call basic fighter maneuvers, which is dog fighting, um, which is one of the things that I teach. Um, so it can be exhausting. Um, the good thing is it, so if imagine if you're, if you're on a bike and you go really fast and then you like do a really sharp turn. So you've got a lot of force, but then what happens? You stop, right? So if you pull, a lot of G's like that, you're depleting energy off of the jet. So you may have like a spike of a lot of G's, uh, but then as you're doing that, your energy is going down. And so you won't be at that high G level for very long. Um, now, when you get down low, um, the jet, especially the F-35, it is a beast down low. Uh, it is, so it's the most powerful jet engine ever put on a fighter aircraft. And when it has a lot of dense air down low, um, it can sustain a, a lot of Gs and not bleed energy because it's just so powerful and it can be very exhausting. Um, so especially in the summer, 
if we're doing a lot of uh, dog fighting, uh, sometimes <laughs> I'll pull back in the chocks and I feel like I have to ask them to bring a crane over to like pull me out of the aircraft <laughs> and just carry me into an air conditioned room because I'm just completely drenched in sweat and exhausted. So um, it's it can be very physically um, challenging. And um, while the feeling those those uh, strains on the body, you mm-hmm. have to stay sharp and continue to do the OODA loop uh, while that's happening. So, yeah. But I guess if I were to sum it up, it's three times harder than I thought anything could possibly be, but it's also ten times as fun as I thought anything could possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> So when it's like physically draining, is it because you're having to like just brace yourself in these, like, I don't think about it. I, I mean, my only comparison could be like bobsledding and like you have to like, oh, I'm like hitting myself, but you like have to keep your, yourself narrow in this space. Mm-hmm. Is, is that why it's physically exhausting or is it because just that amount of force is something you have to brace yourself internally, like when you're in the seat? Yes, it's more the latter. So, um... So if you, the way we're sitting like this, if you were to imagine, you know, when you, when you pull G's, all of the force is going down. So like from the top of your head through your butt, right? And so when you're under those forces, then what happens is the blood in your brain is going to start to leave and it starts to pool in your lower extremities, in your, in your glutes, in your hamstrings, in your ab, uh, uh, abdomen. And so if you allow that to happen... Um, you will what we, you'll have what's called g induced loss of consciousness or a g lock, which is where you you pass out and then mm-hmm. if you don't wake up fast enough, you crash and you die, which is clearly bad, right? So part of the physical um, strain is counteracting that those g forces to make sure that you keep blood in your brain basically. Mm-hmm. And so we have to do this, uh, this maneuver, it's, it's called the anti-G straining maneuver, or the, uh, commonly referred to as the hook maneuver. Because in order to do that, you actually make this hook sound, which is basically you are breathing and you are pushing against a closed glottis. So I'll just demonstrate it for you. It sounds kind of weird, right? So if I'm pulling G's, I have to go <laughs> like that where I'm pushing so that I keep, and then I also have to squeeze my legs, tense mm-hmm. my legs, squeeze my abs in order to just get all that blood to not come out of my head. And so while you're flying, while mm-hmm. you're fighting, because you're not just flying, you're, you're flying, you are fighting, uh, you have to do that maneuver and, and then also fly the aircraft. And so it's just, it can be very exhausting. Yeah. So, but that's just something you don't even think about anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of just, ha- I, if, I know that if I'm doing this, and the faster I am starting that, and the harder I'm doing that, the more I'm going to have to do that maneuver. Um, and then body type has a big, so like a, a shorter, thicker person, who, so think of like a, uh, uh, like a strong man. If you took a strong man, I think those dudes are like seven feet tall, but imagine if he was like, you know, five foot eight. But that mm-hmm. body type, yeah, those dudes probably wouldn't have to do any type of a anti-G straining maneuver if they could fit in the aircraft to begin with, <laughs> right? Because they, um, they, they're just they're they're so dense. Um, the guys who really have a trouble have a lot of trouble with that are marathon runners. So people that are skinnier mm-hmm. that have a very low blood pressure, um, they pass out like crazy. <laughs> Huh. And some of them actually can't, uh, don't, they get washed out of like, uh, you know, fighters cause they, they have to work so hard or sometimes they can't do it. Um, okay. I'm sort of in the middle, you know, I'm a little bit of a bigger guy. Um, but, uh, so, you know, generally I would say about four G's is where my, like, I really don't have to do a whole lot of physical anti G straining maneuver if I'm pulling up to four G's, which is four times the force of gravity, right? Uh, the worst that'll happen is I may have to squeeze my my quads a little bit, um, and once I do that, it's like magic because the first thing you, you see is you start to lose your vision, and what's called uh, uh, tunnel vision, right? So the mm-hmm. blood starts to come out of your eyeballs, and the vision starts to go black, but I'm completely conscious. So if I just squeeze my quads real quick, then it just comes right back. Hmm. Yeah. Do people 
tend to know that's going to come on with the like loss of consciousness or is it just like it's popped and then they're done? Um, well, that's, that's part of the training is recognizing that you have to do that. So if you, if you pull a lot of G's and you spike real quick, then you, it may happen before you even know that it's about to happen. And that's actually the, the most dangerous thing. Guys that have died because of a G lock is because of that thing right there. Uh-huh. Um, so that's part of the training is, Hey, before you pull, you got to get your body ready. So squeeze your, cl- your quads, squeeze your abs start the breathing technique, then pull. But you can't think of it like that. You can't like, okay, you know, because that's like five or six seconds, you're dead. So yeah. like in the tactical scenario, not like mm-hmm. crashing, right? So you have to be very quick, like I'm about to pull, boom, go. And then you do it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with a like algorithm in some aspects, right? If I, I always listen or hear about checklists that are made for takeoff for commercial airlines. Mm-hmm. Like it's like check this mark and it's, and it's like for any other, uh, like medical professional, like if you have a surgeon, they have these, these checklists of things mm-hmm. in order to, whether they take off or whether they start a surgery, it's, 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 it's actually a, a way that people perform better mm-hmm. and have better, more efficient things, less errors happen. Right. Is there a process that, you go through in your head sometimes with some of the tactical things or is it just based on that that previous mission or like the debriefing that you you had that's a great question so it's uh it's both and then what we do especially at the weapons school where i work because one of the things that we also do besides instruct the you know newest uh generation of of instructors that will instruct others is we write the tactical publications so when we see uh, through the kind of the process of things coming to fruition. So a new capability that's then tested and evaluated and then comes to us. And then we, we basically play around with it. We see what, how does this thing work? How, how can it be optimized? Mm. And then we put it into practice and we debrief it and we instruct, we receive feedback from everybody we humble ourselves and see like what personally we needed to do better or whatever, but that's different from how a capability can be optimized. It's just like a human performance problem, Mm -hmm. not necessarily a capability problem. And then we see enough repeated results, then we will write it and we will publish it in a tactics manual so that now everybody, and then that sort of just becomes the way that we do it, do whatever that process is. Um, and so that's called the uh, Air Force Tactics, Techniques, and Procedure 3-1, or AFTTP 3-1, which is like the Bible for F-35. This is how you do things in the F-35. And then we publish it, and then we continue to do it, and then we realize, oh, actually, that's a better way to do it. You know, it's sort of that, that's an ongoing process. Yeah. How long does that process take, typically? Like, um, so the process is continual. Mm-hmm. We will generally have a, a revision <clears throat> uh, process where we will update, delete, add, whatever, every two years. Okay. Yeah, so a new 3-1 will come out every two years. Yeah. Excellent. And what would you like to leave listeners with? Um, that's a good question. Uh, for anybody who is listening, I think that... Um, in all aspects of your life, if you humble yourself and are open to um, open to receiving feedback, whether it's good or bad, then uh, all you can stand to do is to improve your your performance and everything that you do. I love it. And how can people find you? Uh, so people can find me on uh, Instagram. Would probably be the easiest way. Apparently, only old people are on Facebook. So I'm trying to do what the kids are saying. I sort of check it, but I'm not really doing it with Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can find me on Instagram. My handle will be in this podcast. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Well, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, uh, guys. Really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Me Thank too. You. It was fun. Thanks. Appreciate it. We'd like to thank you for listening to La Vida Las Vegas podcast. We hope you enjoyed the time with our guests as much as we did. It would help us out so much if you could share, subscribe, or review our podcast or any combination of the three. Thanks again, and remember to take care of yourself.